Today on Sending Off, we'll be talking with film scoring great Mark Isham, a veteran of over 100 Hollywood films. That's coming up next. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sounding Off. Our special guest today is famed film composer Mark Isham and jazz musician, improviser, trumpet trumpeteer. Uh, Mark has done, been doing film scores for 30 some odd years, Mark. Is that correct? I mean, since the early 80s. That is, that is true, yes. And you've yes. done film scores such as Nell, River Runs Through It, Point Break, Of Mice and Men, Crash, Once Upon a Time, Mrs. Stolfel, Quiz, Quiz Show. You've probably done 100, possibly, or more. I've been told it is uh, at the 100 mark, yeah. <laughs> I lose track, track, to be honest with you. It's, I mean, it's really amazing, and it just goes from then till now. One of the questions is, that I have for you is, how do you come up with ideas over all these years? Uh, well, I don't know. I think it's... Um, I, I think it's because I still really love it, and... There's nothing more than I like at just sitting down at some in instrument and making stuff up. And then when I discovered I could actually get paid for that, uh, it was like a revelation to me. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to, you know, sweat and slave and write music for a record and then sell the record and then tour the record. And that's fine. And I did that for years. But it's another thing to be paid to write a body of work and then to be paid to write another body of work, and then to be paid specifically to write something. And so the fact that that job exists was like a revelation to me, and I turned out that I was actually pretty good at it, but I never studied it. You know, I never went to school for film composition. I, I barely went to school at all, and I barely studied composition at all. But I always just loved making up tunes and pieces and sounds and it never occurred to me that this was really composition because I came into music at a time when you know the studio was becoming the compositional tool you know the multi-track tape recorder was becoming the compositional tool so that I sort of bypassed the traditional education in, in composition and learned from listening to Eno records and to rock records and to and then discovering jazz, of course, and just free jazz, where you just walk on stage and just, we're going to play the color green tonight. Right. You know? All of these different ways of quote-unquote composing sort of coalesced in me in, in a period of five to ten years and sort of made me who I am. And I just still love doing it. And I think part of it is because I do have all these various ways of going about doing it that I can switch up. So if I've just spent three months writing a traditional orchestral score and I'm at the piano and I'm at the keyboard and with my string samples and I'm getting into the details of what's that third clarinet really going to be doing, and then I can turn around and, and get out a, you know, a... a weird 8-bit sampler and just make weird noises for the next month. And it's like clearing your head constantly. I just keep challenging myself. And I mean, one of the big challenges for me was that I, having never studied traditional film scoring, I decided I was going to get good enough at it to be paid to do it, you know, to, to be the guy that I would, that would get called to write a traditional score. And it took me a number of years, but I gradually worked my way up to do that. So I've gone to London and recorded with the LSO and things like that. At the same time, you know, my first film score was all done on a Prophet 5 and a 16-track tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> so I've run the gamut of, of ways of doing things, and I think that that flexibility is one of the main reasons that I just keep doing it and keep loving it. Let me ask you this. So being a jazz musician, and you say you're, you like free jazz. Yeah, it ran, it ran the gamut. I must admit, Miles was the one that got me, you know. the yep. Well, I, actually, originally Cannonball Adderley, and then I discovered Cannonball had played with Miles, and that Nat Adderley owed a lot to Miles. And in fact, in the band right then was Joe Zawinul, and Joe Zawinul had played with Miles. 
And so that pulled me, all roads lead to miles. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was hooked. I was hooked in what the trumpet could do in a modern improvisational setting, whether it meant, you know, bitches brew and embracing funk and, and rock, or it meant kind of blue and embracing the traditional jazz quintet, or as you say, embracing, you know, the really out there just playing free music with a bass player. You know, the Don Cherry. I loved experiencing all of it. Being a jazz musician in particular and being an improviser, does that inform you in a different way and allow you to create ideas from a different place? I think it does. I think that I, I, I sort of intellectually came to the conclusion that, that thinking is not creating. In other words, if, if you get too involved in thinking about what you're going to write or what you're going to play, it doesn't turn out very well, usually. And I think I learned that from being a free jazz musician. You go out there and think too much about it, not a lot of cool stuff is going to happen. Sort of bypass that and get into this pure creation of something. And while an intellectual understanding of composition is a good thing and it can save you a lot of time when you're trying to sort certain things out, the basic process is basically the same as improvising. You have to come up with some cool stuff. Right. <laughs> and so I will challenge myself sometimes to just say, all right, sit down. And it's like you're, it's like you're in front of 10,000 people right now. And you walked out there and you, it's a free jazz concert and you have to improvise a really cool eight bars. And here you go. Two, three, four, start. And I'll put myself in that position in front of whatever I'm writing on, usually a keyboard of some sort. And even though I don't have a lot of technique on a keyboard, I have enough to do that. And, and I sort of force myself into that act of pure creation and not too much thinking. How has film scoring changed since you began? I, I had told you before we started here that I had a record of yours from 1983, Vapor Drawings. And then immediately right after that, I started seeing your name appearing on, on film scores, on big Hollywood movies. Yeah. And obviously back then, movies were done, recorded, orchestral recordings were done to tape, and you would have synthesizers that you would... I guess, overdub, uh, yeah. you'd have everything locked up. You'd probably were using two 24-track machines at the time. How would you incorporate synthesized sounds with orchestral sounds then versus now, and when did it change, and how has that affected? This is kind of a multi-part question, but yeah. over the years, you know, obviously things are very different now. Well, they're different technologically now. Um, conceptually... I don't know if my approach, my compositional demands upon myself and interests and, and concepts have changed that much. My very first film score was a hybrid of electronic and, and chamber orchestra. And not because I intellectually thought about that, but because I was only really at that point in my life confident composing as an electronic musician. Film sort of demanded a little more than that. It demanded a little more warmth. It demanded some real performances on traditional instruments so you could get a little motion going. Besides, one of the characters in the, in the film played the bassoon, so we needed a bassoonist, and the bassoon took over as the lead instrument of the score as well. So it just by happenstance became a hybrid score which I, to this day, do. I just wrote it, uh, a score for Jodie Foster that's electronics and cello. You know, it was almost very, very similar in concept that you construct this unheard of world electronically and then you put some sort of organic performance-based instrument in the middle of it. Really exactly. fascinating. Which, which became sort of my signature jazz sound for many years. Now, how we do that technologically has changed completely. Yes. I mean, I started off before the computer was not a musical instrument. <laughs> so, and it was. We were, I mean, if you could afford it, we would lock up two tape machines. If not, we're just bouncing on one eight track in the old days. Um, and, and now, of course, it can all be in the computer. We don't have to, we, we never touch tape. We never have to go outside of off the screen again. I mean, it's, it's very, very different. But 
I say it serves the concept of the music and that those concepts for me have not really changed that much. You know, I still think that electronics are fabulous in constructing an unheard of musical universe, a brand new unique musical universe. And as good as they are, there's still something about a synthesizer that's never going to have the same warmth and communicative power as a beautiful violinist. It just, it's got a thousand years to catch up, you know? <laughs> Violin's been around a long time. <laughs> it's got a lot of evolution. It's got a lot of technique that's been built in, into the instrument and a lot of emotive qualities that you can get out of it. That those certain emotions just don't come out of electronics yet. Now, electronics can give you a lot of stuff that a violin can never give you. So they're both incredibly valid. And as far as I'm concerned, you need them all. You need them all in your back pocket. You need to be able to go to whom and whatever you need when you need it. When you are thinking of a score like A River Runs Through It that has a combination of orchestral music that sounds very open and American, Copeland-esque maybe, some of the some of the cues. And then you have some yeah. period piece, big band music. When you're doing a film score like that, what kind of suggestions are made by a director? Do, do they say, okay, we need something for this section that is like this? How does that work, that process work? The process is slightly different depending on who the director is. There are certain directors who have done copious amounts of homework, who have built a very intricate temporary score out of other music, already recorded music. And so they know almost down to the to the you know eight bar phrase what they want. You know, that it needs to be sad here, then it needs to get angry, and then it needs to get unknowing. I mean, they can talk you through exactly the emotional curve of everything. And they, they have a musical examples to play for you. And then there are other directors who are much more, I want you, I want you to do what you do and bring it to me and I'll react. So it runs the gamut. Having said that, there is a process in filmmaking called temp scoring, temporary scoring which happens usually as the film is being cut. You know, the picture editor themselves may be putting in music. The picture editor may be working with a music editor to put in music. They go back and forth, and the music editor delivers some music to the picture editor. And this can happen long before because it may actually influence who they hire. Are you talking temp music about pre-existing music, orchestral music, or whatever kind of music if they put in a Brahms piece or a, you know, a Webern piece or something, and they that's the temp score. Yeah. Or they put in a Hans Zimmer piece or a Mark Eichen piece or, you know, another score. Yeah. Because they yeah. want to know. They want to know what what's the sound of this film. Some directors will ha be playing music on the set and listening to certain types of music as they shoot to get a sense of, well, what is the sound of my film? I've had directors who've actually written scripts and listened to scripts. I mean, listen to scores as they write so that they'll have a head start in their own head as to what they think the sound of this film is. It doesn't always hold. doesn't always come true to be the right choice. But again, certain directors will have attention on this from a very early point. And as you say, Yes, they put a piece of Brahms in, and they love it. So, well, who are we going to go to? Well, John Williams does <laughs> Brahms. Let's call him. <laughs> Maybe we won't call Moby, you know, right. <laughs> for that. <laughs> Whereas if we put in a Moby song, and that works great, well, let's call Moby. See right. if he would want to do, do some stuff, you know? So when you actually get, you'll get a temp score with a rough cut of the movie, and then you'll begin writing to that. You'll mute those those pieces, yeah, and then you start writing to it. When you tell me about your process as you start, do you use virtual instruments these days more than, than than just using a piano in the old days, where you would imagine what the orchestration would be? Ninety percent of the scores I start in the studio in front of my keyboard with a computer, well, four computers, <laughs> two of which are completely loaded up with virtual instruments. 
so that I have a wide palette of choices of things that I can build and start with. Very rarely these days, um, but for instance, I scored a movie called 42, the Jackie Robinson story yeah. a couple of years ago. And the director hired me because I had done a number of films that were very Americana based. You mentioned A River Runs Through It, one of them. And he wanted a very Americana traditional score. And he thought I was the guy to do that. Plus I've done quite a number of sports movies and I seem to have a knack for that, those heroic moments and moments of bitter triumph and things like that. <laughs> so he hired me and we did we want a score. I actually grabbed a pad of paper and went and sat at the piano for a week. And it better work on the piano and then you know it'll work. But that doesn't happen a lot because to be honest with you, in the last five, maybe even starting 10 years ago, um, Melodies sort of become, uh, you know, they don't want not, big mel not that many big melodies these days yeah. in film scoring. Film scoring's gotten much more ambient, much more textural, much more motival. And so the big 16 bar, 32 bar theme is not that present in uh, present day film scoring. And how, how do you feel about that? You know, I don't, I understand it. I've tried to force an eight-bar melody into certain types of films, and I'll be the first one to say, you know, it doesn't work. There's a certain type of filmmaking going on today that responds much more to just a fantastically complex and yet subtle drone <laughs> rather than eight French horns playing da-da-da-da-da. You know, it just doesn't, it's over the top for a Temporary film music. Speaking of your setup that you have, what what DAW do you work in? I work in Logic. Okay. I work in Logic Nine. <laughs> <laughs> never really? <did> change. <laughs> ne never change, right? Never change. I, I'm. I've tried. To, I just can't wrap my head. I don't know why. My little complaining moment here is why would anybody take a program that works so well and put everything in another place? It's fine if you want to improve it, but why do you have to put everything in a different place? I figure that about every single program that I use, I think the same thing. Anytime that there's a new change to it, I use Logic and I use Pro Tools, and you just have to relearn things, and it's 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 just a waste of time to me. Once you have it right, don't don't touch it. I do all the writing in in Logic. Logic is. Uh, normal to Pro Tools in sync, so the Pro Tools changes Logic. I don't ask Logic to do very much other than sequence uh, because it can get temperamental. Uh, Pro Tools holds the picture. Pro Tools is all the audio recording. Um, I have two other computers for sounds. I use a Vienna-based system, so everything just is over Ethernet. And that's basically it. It's a pretty powerful system, even though slightly complex, a little unwieldy, but it, it works. You can get a big, big, big sound. When I listen to certain film scores, I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, that's definitely a virtual instrument in the low end, like in the basses, for example, when you have, you'll have a low C sharp or something, and you'll have basses that have extensions on them, but you'll say, I mean, I'll say to myself, well, that, you know, that sounds so full, there's no, no way there's not some augmentation with, with a virtual right. instrument. Does that happen quite a lot? Oh, yeah, I, I do it all the time. Okay. Um, I mean, you any decent theater and sound design is massive. So the idea that you can get away with, you know, sort of a small, it, it depends on the film. Obviously, certain films have been scored by string quartets and they sound gorgeous and lovely and work very, very well. But you can't do Superman versus Batman like that. If you do, you have to get some really great compressors. <laughs> you know, the, tech, the technology has to be used to help fill up that space, to help compete against, quite frankly, teams and teams of people who are making sounds that are unbelievably aggressive and do fill up that space. So it's, it's a technological competition almost to make sure that the music is produced very, very, very well and can stand up and take hold of the theatrical space. Why do you think that you've been so successful in, in doing so many films? Uh, well, I'm a reasonably sane person. <laughs> I, 
I, I'm a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> People seem to like me. I, I'm pretty good at what I do. And I'm, I also understand that filmmaking is a, uh, um, a group effort. You know, I, you can't just write something and say, well, that's it. That's your score. Take it or leave it. You know, that's my artistic vision and that's it. And nothing can change my mind. You can't do that. You know, you're making something that has to fit within a storytelling environment that's being captained by a director and usually a producer or two. And that vision has to be the paramount thing that you're working towards, is completing that vision. And if it means that you have to lose that best eight bars that you've ever written in your entire life because it just doesn't work, then that means, that's what it means. How often does it happen where you'll say, oh, that doesn't work in your head, and the director says, I love that, for example? Does that happen often? That, that doesn't happen too often because I think one of the reasons that I do continue to work as much as I do, I, I have really developed my ability to duplicate a director's point of view to a great degree. I actually have had scores where virtually I have no notes. And, I, and the reason is because I do take the time to really understand what a director wants and what the producer wants and what the film really needs musically. And that, that's sort of a rarefied skill that just, I don't know how to teach, it's just something that this 30 year I've been doing this has, has given me a really pretty good sense of how to do that. If I were to ask you about harmonic language of composers that <laughs> you love or people that influenced you, you know, famous composers that influenced you in your orchestral writing, not, not in jazz, but who are some of the, the influences that, that you would say were the biggest influences on you? Well, if we go back to my early days in my early 20s or late teens, uh, Mahler was one of the first. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play um, at an early stage to get jobs playing in the San Francisco and the Oakland symphonies, you know, playing fifth trumpet, offstage trumpet. So I played a lot of Mahler symphonies. I played co-principal on Mahler's third once and, and really just loved that whole experience immersion into the world of Mahler. So I actually did some transcriptions and learned that harmonic language because that's a, he's a transitional guy. You know, he's, he's <laughs> coming out of the romantic, almost into the modern, but still incredibly tonal and, but very rich and complex at the same time. Uh, Samuel Barber was another one. Um, for the same reason that the, he's starting to play with the harmonies and yet he's still not afraid of a triad, you know. Uh, Vaughn Williams. Um, and then Brian Eno was an influence on me. Um, a lot of those ambient records, music for airports. I mean, what, what was that, you know? And, and so I learned about looping and, and overlapping loops and that whole sort of collage of where you're really starting to come up with other compositional techniques other than what, you know, the orchestral guys have. As far as any modern 20th century, after you got Samuel Barber, then was, I mean, were you... Yeah, well, then then it sort of evolved and sort of invaded the classical world. Obviously, Terry Riley and Steve Reich and, and John Adams um, became huge. I was huge fan of those guys. Arvo Peart, um, Gorecki, you know, all of but that was sort of my next group of the guys. And to this day, you know, I buy every record that John Adams makes and I buy, you know, a lot of his scores. And if I've done any sort of real studying of modern orchestral music, it's probably John Adams. Uh, gone back and put on my my student hat and uh, <laughs> get out the pencil and say, what the hell is he doing? I need to know that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> my, my basic concept of educating myself, because I'm completely self-taught, is that when I hear a piece of music that affects me emotionally tremendously, like the hair on my arm or the 
I just can't, I need to hear it again. Whatever that impact is, I want to know what that technique is that that composer is using so that I can assimilate that because obviously I find it incredibly emotional, incredibly impactful. So there has to be something that they're doing there that I need to know. And so I've gotten a, the ability just to, to take a score or take a record and, and just figure out well, what's, what is it that's defining that characteristic there. You know, and I did it to jazz too. I mean, I did it from to Miles, and I did it with Zawinul, and I did it with Wayne Shorter. Because again, when those guys would play, I would just go ecstatic. I mean, I just go, oh my God! I did it with Train, you know, and Train, of course, is pretty well documented because he did it with so many people. But to find out, all right, what does Shorter do that's different than Coltrane? Because there's obviously they come out of the same school, and Shorter sat at the feet of Coltrane and learned that stuff, but he did something with it to make it his own. He was also so a very different that? composer too. In his 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 composition style was very different than Coltrane. I mean, it wasn't just not not even just hard bop to to Wayne Shorter that incorporated a lot of different harmonic, you know, material and stylistic things than than Coltrane, who you know, in his defense, died at a young age. Um, yeah. And Wayne Shorter is still with us. In jazz, for example, this brings up an interesting point. Jazz players use melodic ideas. Like you'll hear classical players talk about the octatonic scale, the diminished scale that, that you play over a dominant seven flat nine chord, you know, that the jazz players just use all the time. They don't think about it. Yeah. And being a jazz musician and improvising. Do you think that that for you to come up with melodic ideas and just thinking like that and using vocabulary that you would use as a jazz player that really helps you as a composer? I think it does. I mean this may sound sacrilegious to the to the classical fellows Please. and ladies, but I actually think that from the 50s onward, 50s, 60s and 70s Harmony in classical music really sucked. I mean, it wasn't really until the minimalists came along and was willing to pay, play some tonal music again that, you know, it sort of got interesting again. It, it sort of classical music, I don't know, they, the 12 tone must have done something where it, it, to be hip it had to be ugly or something. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> And it wasn't, and it was really the jazz guys, starting with Bill Evans yep. and Herbie Hancock, Keith Jarrett, that started to expand dense, beautiful harmony, right? And you could lose the Cole Porter song aspect of it, you know, and that's the beauty of those late Miles Quintet records, is because it's not sounding like like cocktail harmony anymore, you know. They're taking the raised fifth and the and the flat nine and all those substitutions that have sort of made cocktail music very interesting. <laughs> but you start to write differently with the sounds. All of a sudden, you've got a very very interesting harmony harmonic vocabulary. And so I really think that the jazz guys sort of put American composition on the map, and then the classical guys sort of went. Holy shit. <laughs> there is something else to do than just play, you know, insanely dissonant music. Now you have John Adams, who's just reinvented the ent entire... And I know this is all sacrilege, but... <laughs> okay, so why do you think that jazz, and this is kind of off topic, why do you think jazz has such a difficult time, jazz music, connecting with people nowadays? Well, because I think the jazz model of playing a 16 melody and then five minutes of solos and then a 16 bar melody i think that that is dead i don't listen to that and i don't jazz man that does that anymore i i think that that may have made it up through coltrane but <laughs> and miles but even miles turned his back on that sure you know, in a way yeah. you know do you listen to EDM music, for example, for any inspiration nowadays, or is there anything that any modern, any things that your kids listen to that you say, well, that's those are cool sounds um, that that you're that you may pick up through your day to day life? Yeah, I listen to pretty much 
anything that comes along. Um, I can't say that the one big genre of music that enthralls me. I mean, basic pop music I tend to not like very much. Right. A song will come along that's so well produced and has so many interesting sounds that I'll go, wow, that's, let me hear that again. <laughs> How do I get those sounds? Those are really cool. I could do it with those. I wouldn't do that, but I could do something with those. <laughs> you know? How often will you do your own orchestration or do you, because the, these things are so time consuming, people have, you have orchestrators that you'll work with. Is that correct? Yeah. I have a guy who I've worked with for oh, 10 years at least, uh, who is quote unquote my orchestrator. And how much collaboration do you guys have? Um, so will he be working on an orchestration while you're continuing to work on, on composing? I can get him some while I'm still in the middle of things, but generally I sort of like to have it sketched out and approved before he starts. I don't want to waste his time. Will that sketch be a an electronic mock-up of it using virtual instruments, for example? Yeah, 99 times out of 100, it has to be enough. Shall we say executives who have a limited musical imagination, uh, <laughs> it, it can't... It can't just suggest as it's going to be. It has to pretty much deliver what it is <laughs> for them to say, yes, we're going to give you, spend the, the large sums of money we're going to give you. Very little of the imagination. Um, and certainly mixed into a rough film mix with dialogue and sound effects, you know, it, it sounds like the real thing. I was going to say, having said that, if you take that into a real theatrical environment against the final sound effects, you'd start to notice its deficiencies, obviously. But in a in a temporary context, in a you know in a stereo, it tells the story of what you're getting here. What yeah. sound libraries, for example? I know that you use East West because we've we've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, are there any particular East West libraries that that you like or that are go to sounds for you? They have a bunch of string stuff that we use. Which Hollywood scoring string? Yeah, we have that. I know they have a large, like Storm Drum, I think it's called, a large percussion library, which we use all the time. We have Storm Drum 1, 2, I don't know. We have every one they've ever made. <laughs> and all the offshoots, the various collections of different percussion. I think they, they did Ministry of Rock, right? They yeah. did that, that stuff too. Yeah, and we have all that. Because there's sometimes, I you know, I even get into... I don't do a lot of rock and roll scores, but they're definitely scores that have to be influenced by that stuff and have a hard edge around them. So that stuff's great for that. Like I say, I have two full computers worth of worth of stuff that that has to be there. I have to be able to get to pretty quickly and has to sound great. But that Vieta has that shell that <clears throat> you can load up, uh, like the East West Play or the Contact or any of the, the the players that are out there, and they all show up in Logic on logic faders. And do you have templates already set up? Okay, I've got this template that that will just bring up a series of sounds that you know you want to use. How many different templates will you work off of typically? Um, I have sort of chamber orchestra template. I have a large massive, you know, action score template. I'll have a more modern template that's more electronic based but with some strings. Um but mostly we keep templates that were sort of defined by the projects themselves. Like, for instance, I did uh, a film called The Accountant that came out last year. And that needed everything. So that's one of our biggest templates. And I will probably save The Accountant template knowing that it had a full orchestra, including solo cellos and uh, solo cello, really good solo cello patch. Um, and a massive percussion library. Um, so if I know, well, I need solo strings, but I need a big orchestra, but boy, I need to be able to hit things really on the face, I'll say, well, oh, remember the accountant? Yeah, let's pull up the accountant template. And I want to tell people that they should go to your website and look at the, the, the it's, it's like a documentary of, of making of that in the, in the studio, correct? Oh, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, there is. Yeah. That's up there. And it's yeah. it's uh, it's really fascinating to watch because uh, you're talking about the solo cello piece, but there is you see the cellist playing parts on there, and then you're in the control room with the director. I assume that that's that's yes. and discussing. Are you got what are you guys discussing as it's going on? What do you talk about? Well, it's basically at that point, it's just more subtle nuance. You know, 
especially on the accountant. That's Gavin O'Connor, who I've, this is our fourth film together. Um, you know, the period of a month before we're scoring, he's practically lived at my house, just going over the demos, going over the score. I mean, there's nothing that he hasn't heard 15 times and given me notes on and, and we've talked about. And, and he basically, going up to the recording session, very happy with his score, not expecting any big changes or anything, and only that it's going to sound better than it's ever sounded before. Because that's what I want. I don't want to go into a scoring session with all sorts of unknowns. <laughs> yeah, there's too much money at stake. You know, this is costing yeah. tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> a minute, you know, to, to have that many people and that much technology all in one place. And uh, so you want to you want to know that you've done that. Not, not to say that there are not going to be moments where you kind of go, let's try something like that. I've never heard that cello. Let's have him do this, too. You know, you want moments as, as well and you want everything else to be so worked out that you can buy yourself that relaxed space to try something that's going to holy shit moment that that was cool when you're done with your tracking session who takes the sessions and and does the the mixing and editing of them how much are you involved in that uh, i have an engineer i work with now for i mean i've worked with many engineers over the years i have a guy now who i'm pretty stably working with for about five years and it that's his job um, a film like The Accountants, we probably had we had a whole percussion session. We had all my electronics, and then we had the orchestra. So by the time you're in the mix session, somebody, one of his guys, is having to figure out how to run three Pro Tools sessions all locked up, or do we transfer two of them together? You know, I let the, them deal with that. <laughs> it's hundreds of tracks. Hundreds of tracks. And when the mixes are, are ready for you to be heard by you, do they send you just roughs of them and you listen at home or do you, uh, with, with, with picture, or do you actually go to the studio and listen to the, to the mixes? It, it depends. Um, on the accountant, it was such a big mix, we actually mixed at the Warner Brothers stage. Okay. Because I have a mixing room here, uh, but couldn't fit it that side of the project on my on my room. All the television shows and small movies that I do, I mix here. So I just, I don't mix them myself. No, my, my guy comes out and he knows the room really well. He, he helps, you know, update it and upgrade what he wants in it. So it's almost his own personal room at this point. Is there anything that you want people to know about you or that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you know, you're as much of a pro and a veteran of this industry as you can possibly be. I mean, to have a career this long, is there, is there anything that you want people to know about you as, and, and, what, and what you do or that they may be surprised about or any type of, you know, anything like that? It probably just goes back to what, almost what I started with. I mean, I have been for 30 years or more longer, but I, there are times when I still feel like a kid. I'm an avid synthesizer guy, right? I love synthesizers. I have a collection. I have some of Bob Moog's original test modules from 1967. I mean, wow. I've been collecting these things for a long, long, long time. <laughs> and I could not be more excited than I ordered two new Eurorack modules the other day, and they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, they're, they're brand new, and they're going to do stuff I've never heard before, and I can't wait. You know, I'm I'm as intrigued by this whole thing of making music and what impacts music can have on people than I ever have been. And I think technology today is so fabulous in the way it can help us explore these things that, you know, I'm ex I'm as more excited than ever, actually, about what I do. So you think that this is really an incredible time to be doing what you're doing right now because because of technology? I do. I mean, it. it you know, sometimes I get a little peeved about it because I remember how much work we had to go through. <laughs> I was describing to, to some, some guys that work for me, right, who are significantly younger, <laughs> that in the old days when we made tape loops, in fact, and I did this live, my friend had a TA and I had a rocks, and we used to take them to the club 
And on what and on the front of the stage and stage left, we'd put the TIAC on the stage right. We'd put the Revox and we'd run the tape across the front of the stage and we'd both patch in. And that was our live looping device. Unbelievable. <laughs> and now, of course, you could buy a boss pedal for like forty nine dollars that does all of this. And it's this big. Right. <laughs> you know but that's what we did and it was you know it was a blast and it was um and so i i just think it's all it's all there for the taking and for the making and for the exploring and everyone should just dive in excellent well mark this has been fantastic i really really appreciate you doing this my pleasure and i look forward to speaking with you again in the future and like i said i've been a big fan for th for 30 some odd years of you and it's it's great <laughs> to uh Great to meet you in person. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. I'd like to thank Mark again for being our guest today. And remember, please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.